Hey now, before we get into the breakdown and review of the Acolyte E7, aka Choice, spoilers! I can sense through the force that Episode 7 of the Acolyte, titled Choice, will embolden the trolls and convince others that the show's creatives are dopey and don't know how to tell a coherent story. And while I can agree that this episode shouldn't have spent the entire runtime in the past, it still featured some intriguing new perspectives on the Brendock incident, while also adding more to the lore of the Jedi, the Force at large, and how those who can wield it should actually use it. Before I get into the issues with this episode, which again to me are rooted in the lack of check-in on the present timeline, specifically with Osha and Kamir, I have to spend some time on the Jedi and how they were portrayed from Soul's point of view. Watching each Jedi fail themselves, their training and their order was very intriguing and really helped to foreshadow the troubles to come for the order not even a full century later. Sol showed that he, and quite frankly Torben and Indara, I can't shame Kalnaka, he was just along for the ride, are literally the prototypes for the downfall of the Jedi and that they could make rash decisions and act before thinking about the consequences. Even if their intentions may have seemed noble to them, the result of their rashness and acting on emotion set them all up for personal failure, and on a more global Jedi scale, the failure of the Order itself. Think about how this Brendock thing has been festering for 16 years with the Four covering it and how it affected them, and then consider Vernestra aiding in the present timeline cover-up of the fallout from their action on Brendock. One could definitely see how this order and its benevolent followers could become so full of themselves and their righteousness that they allow their mortal enemies to rise in front of their faces and wipe them out. If Jedi always think they're being noble, how could they ever think a dark force would rise against them? Back to Sol, who probably did think he was doing the right thing, but in reality, he was actually making choices that ultimately led to the destruction of the Witch Coven, the eventual deaths of his three other companions, and as Indara implied, the changing of the destiny of both of the twins thanks to his emotional choices. He took what Qui-Gon did with Anakin to a whole new level, but with even deeper emotions and convictions. Jin seemingly was always cool on the surface, even when others doubted his claims of the Chosen One and him needing to be trained. But Sol, on the other hand, really went out of his way to fulfill his need to have a Padawan with some odd instant connection to Osha. Sol really did seem like he instantly became attached to Osha after only seeing the twins at the tree interact for the first time. So I can get down with that feeling very odd, a bit rushed, and lacking additional insights into why he may have felt the need to form such a strong emotional connection with a stranger the moment he saw her. As much as we all may want to blame Torben for the actual disaster that took place on Brendock for rushing headlong to get the twins so he could go home, it was Sol that initially overstepped by spying on the witches, making assumptions about their customs, and then convincing the much more wise Indara that she should listen to him even though she knows she needs to do the right thing and abide by the council's ruling. Without Sol essentially manipulating Indara, none of what we saw happens. You can definitely argue that the witches had an equal hand in the destruction of their coven thanks to Coral's band of antagonists, but without Sol having a hard-on for getting his first Padawan, I do believe no one's destinies on Brendock would have changed that night. What I had some trouble with was Indara's choice to essentially cover it all up with a clean lie. Even by the end of it all, Sol was ready for atonement, but after everything that happened because of him, and Indara caving to his desires, she too decided to make a rash and emotional choice by reinforcing the idea that May was responsible for the death of everyone, forcing Sol to give up his quest for atonement in favor of giving Osha her dreams of becoming a Jedi. My trouble with that action is then who is really to blame in the end? Sol? or the leader of the mission who made the final call to keep the Brendock lie alive. Have fun with that in the comments, my friends. In terms of the witches, I kind of dug the new phasing power Anisei and Coral put on display. I'm not as bent over Anisei's death by using it. To me, she was only trying to prevent bloodshed and was trying to phase over to Mei, or physically with Mei, to save her after hearing her plea for help. And I think Osha's screams played a role in that too. I also understand Sol's reaction. How could he know some demon-looking particle lady wasn't going to take everyone out? Plus, he thought she was phasing with Osha, not May. So again, he let his emotions for this little girl drive a rash, but in the moment justified action. 
You could argue Mother should have led with the fact that she was letting Osha join the Order. But by the time she arrived, the tension between the Jedi and Coral's angry witches was so high she didn't really have a chance before the other parties decided to act on instinct, resulting in her going full mama bear and trying to protect her kids and her Order. Hopefully we learn a bit more on the witch phasing and why one of the twins seemed to phase with her, as it could add more insight into the power of one, two, and many stuff, as well as the notion that a virgins in the force split one being into two. Are the twins split from their mother's essence? Or did some other outside force, literal that is, have a hand in their creation that formed two beings with the same symbionts? These are the narrative thread questions that concern me now that we have just one episode left that you know will probably clock in under 40 minutes. This is why this episode spending the entire time rehashing a flashback, albeit from a new point of view, could lead to the series being considered a bit of a fail, even by a shill like myself. By not spending any time in the present, to tee up the finale, this episode has left the series end in a tough spot to thread the needle as they say. Personally, I still think this series and the story it is trying to tell can stick the landing next week, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't highly concerned after not getting any updates on present day Sol, and May, and Osha, and Kamir. Not checking in on Kosha felt a bit criminal, and I do believe if this episode's final five minutes or so flip back to the present, it could have been one of its best and a great lead into the finale. But now, it is truly uncertain if all the key threads, which are the fates of the twins, the fates of Sol and Kamir, Mother Corel's fate, and finally Vernestra's ultimate fate in regards to how she possibly plays into all this outside of leading the present day cover up of the mess that Sol and the other three Jedi caused on Brendock 16 years ago. Fingers crossed, but with my bunghole puckered going into next week, that is for sure. Alright, top moments. While this episode truly only had one standout moment, which I'll get to next, I will say that I dug how Anisea's mind control powers worked on Torben. It was portrayed in a great way to show how she was able to get into his mind via the permission he gave her to help him get home, and how she embodied the mantra of the Sith and non-Jedi by playing into his desires like the devil can play on her own. Her popping in and out of frame, getting in his face, and whispering sweet nothings to him just played out very well visually and helped to show how powerful and seductive a freewheeling force user can be. The next top moment makes the list purely for the fact that we finally got to see a Wookiee ash Jedi in live action getting down against other force users with lightsabers, even if he was trying to kill his buds. I mean, kudos to Eunice if that was him during the fight scenes, because I thought he did a perfect job in showing what a being of a Wookiee size would look like wielding a lightsaber and the force with the passion of a Darksider. His attacks were violent, menacing, and extremely brutish, and I loved it. To top it all off, we then get some insights into how all the witches died by learning Indara nuked them all by getting them out of Kel's noggin. The poor master tried so hard to have her team do the right things, but in the end, to help save them and clean it all up, she too went against her Jedi code and made some rash choices to further question how Jedi really should go about their galactic business. Now for eggs and references. Maybe me, but these stones on Brendock had strong Night Sister structure vibes as seen on Setos and Peridia from the Ahsoka series. They're not Night Sisters as revealed in this episode, but maybe that order once had ties to Brendock and its virgins? Fun stuff to think about. Up next, we learn that Brendock was supposed to be a dead planet due to the hyperspace disaster that is from the first phase of the High Republic novels. Torben doesn't like Nuna legs, which are little swamp turkeys that have been featured in other properties prior. The four Jedi are looking for a virgins in the force on Brendok, which is what Qui-Gon thought Anakin was after, after discovering he had no father. The Order even questions him on a virgins being a person instead of a place. Torben asks if the witches are night sisters, so hey, they gotta mention after all. He also drops M-Count, which is clearly the new cool way to say midichlorians, sorry Georgie boy. He also discusses symbionts, which plays in the Qui-Gon explaining to Anakin how middies work within a being to give them force powers. And finally, as she was spending time talking a bit of smack instead of just saying, hey, take my kid, the mother drops an Order 66 prediction by reminding Sol that the Jedi's noble intentions will be their downfall one day. 
Hey, thanks for watching. Please consider subbing to the channel or becoming a member by hitting the action down below. Leave a comment, even a nice one if that's in you. And don't forget that there's always time for Star Wars time. And if you listen to the Star Wars time show, the Force will be with you. Always.